Turning on the taps, crude tumbles as the White House weighs a massive release of reserves to battle rising gasoline prices, while Russia offers oil to India at a steep discount. The U.S. says President Putin has been misled about the war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Germany says Russia is backing off demands for gas payments in rubles. Plus, turning to Beijing, Apple is said to be exploring new memory chip suppliers, including potentially its first from China. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, this is a picture for the markets, a lot of focus on that stockpile reserve release that we hear the Biden administration is looking at. So European stocks, they did start off the day on a high. Now they're pretty much unchanged, if not a bit lower. Now, oil um, is still falling. Stocks are a little bit mixed. Investors, again, weighing reports from the Biden administration about this massive release of crude, but also they're weighing concerns about surging inflation. I know we talk about it every day, and it seems that the market really hasn't made up its mind, it'll be up to central banks either to assuage them or actually to say, look, they're um, being a lot more hawkish. We'll see because of this rise in inflation. So President Joe Biden wants to take action on price increases at the pump. Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. is planning to tap into its oil reserves as inflation spirals and supply shortages loom due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The administration could release as much as 180 million barrels over the course of several months. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this Helen Robertson, our Energy and Commodities Editor in London. Helen, thank you for joining us. So first of all, this is a huge, huge, huge amount of releases. What would it do in the short term in terms of oil prices? In the short term, it's likely that it would bring down prices. But over the longer term, um, you know, looking at the global picture, obviously what really, really matters is the course of action that OPEC Plus takes. Yeah. Um, and of course, we have a meeting later today, likely to be a key one. Uh, what we're expecting is that the group will ratify a, uh, in effect, pre-existing uh, deal to increase output by just a modest amount. Uh, we've heard sort of over the past few days that key OPEC Plus members have come out very much in support of Russia in terms of its strategic importance within the group. They've said very clearly they want to keep global geopolitics out of oil market um, supply decisions. So we'll see what happens. So, Helen, is it dangerous if you release so many stockpiles now? I mean, you have to replenish them. If you try and do that in, in the winter months, could it actually be a mistake? So short-term relief in terms of inflation or oil prices, but then longer term we suffer. Of course. And obviously, this is an absolutely key thing that President Biden's got to balance at the moment. Obviously, bringing down inflation, keeping uh, sort of consumers at the pump happy. As we know, gasoline prices um, have hit unprecedented levels for U.S. consumers. Um, you know, obviously, uh, an issue of incredible political importance well, to them and obviously uh, to the White House. Um, and then obviously balancing that with global supply issues. Um, as we know, President Biden has appealed directly to OPEC Plus yeah. in recent months, um, urging so them... So far, though, they're like, exactly. <laughs> sure, uh, talk to the hands. Exactly. He, you know, he's, he's, he's made a direct appeal urging them to release um, additional supplies, yeah. and it's not had much success. Um, Helen, I mean, the other before, because I know you have some reporting to do, and actually we look at, you know, what this means for the markets. We heard from Goldman Sachs. We heard uh, from Oanda. We heard from Clearview Energy Partners about how they see this playing out. But would this be coordinated? Because that, that feels pretty crucial. So w would it just be the US or would it be with the IEA and others? Um, I don't think we have those details at the moment. I, I mean, we believe that a, a decision on whether this will actually happen could be made as soon as today. We know that obviously the IEA has been in um, discussions with its members to, uh, over a, a coordinated stockpile uh, release. But I, I think so much hinges on the decision that OPEC Plus makes today and then what we hear later on from the White House. Yeah, it's just the numbers are quite big that it really means, you know, if they go through with it, it means that they mean uh, business. So one person from Clearview is saying it's hard to overstate the scale of this in intervention if it bears out. Helen, thank you so much. Helen Robertson there from our energy and commodities team here in London. So JP Morgan does not see a global recession 2022, but sees tighter monetary policy, the war in Ukraine and lingering inflation putting the brakes on global growth. The asset manager expects supply constraints to keep inflation elevated and central banks to lean hawkish. Well, we're now joined by John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. John, I don't know where to start. I have like a million and one questions, really hard questions. First of all, I mean, the stockpile, the numbers are huge. Uh, could it be, if not a policy mistake, could it, could it be, you know, a political message to Putin to say like, look, we got this, but at the end of the day, could it backfire? In terms of the oil release, um, look, I think that the U.S. consumer is concerned going yes. into what the Americans call driving season yeah. about pump prices. There's no doubt there's a, it's more to do with that, I would argue. There's a sticker shock when yeah. you see gasoline at four bucks and north of barrel. Yeah. 
But actually, if we look at the facts, it's super interesting. If you take the real price of gasoline and you look backwards, actually, gasoline at the pump, in real terms, is slightly less expensive than it was immediately following the financial crisis. Electricity prices are lower. Natural gas prices to American households are lower. Yes, they're moving yes. upwards, make no mistake, <laughs> but the share of disposable income spent on energy in the US right. is hovering only around 3.5% today. John, how do you explain the freak out? Is it because we haven't seen any inflation for three, four years that, that we actually just don't really know how to deal with it? And by we, I mean markets, I mean investors and central banks. Well, again, let's look at how, how we got to where we are. We've had supply shocks that have been brought about by a, um, not, not just the crisis and the war in Ukraine, but have been brought about previously by yes. the aftermath to, yeah. to COVID. So that huge supply disruption takes a while to work through the system. But secondly, remember, unlike the 2010s, we've had monetary and fiscal stimulus together, not just pushing on a string, yeah. but giving it a good hard yank as well. And of course, that's created this upward pressure on prices. We've got tight labor markets in the US. The Fed have to respond to this inflationary threat. Mm -hmm. And what do markets want? Why are they not taking it too negatively in stock yeah. market terms? Why? I would argue because <laughs> the f we want to see a credible central bank. Central bank, the Jay Powell and his team have got the memo now and they are pushing ahead to address this otherwise threatening issue. What does a credible central bank look like? So is it front loading? Is it 50 basis points? And is there going to be a communication concern? Because what, ha you know, 50 basis points, does it mean that they're panicking? And what happens the next time round? No, not at all. I mean, I think it's what they're doing is they're responding to yeah. the conditions that they see, which is the right thing to do. We've now got 225 basis points of hikes priced in for this year. That's a significant amount of upside to the Fed funds rate. It's worth noting, if you, everyone's talking a lot about yield curves, about twos, tens, the Fed care a lot more about three-month, yes. two-year, because that's demonstrating that the Fed have been, yes, behind the curve, some would argue, yeah. Responding to risks to the macro economy, others might argue. The fact is that they now recognize the need to tighten policy conditions mm -hmm. within the US, and that, of course, is what's led us to the point where we've got the steepest front end of the curve yeah. that we've seen in many years. Two standard deviations in two month, in three month, two year, compared to the long run history. Tom Keane sent me that chart. You sound like Tom Keane, John. You'll, <laughs> we'll have you back. Uh, wear a bow tie next what, time. Yes, maybe red with a couple of dollar signs. <laughs> when you look at what that means overall for the the risk of stagflation. Are we there yet? And is there a danger that, again, the Fed actually focuses so much on inflation that they forget about growth? Well, look, let's make no mistake. When the Fed tighten monetary conditions, there is, it carries with it a threat that it will eventually lead to a, a destruction in yeah. demand. And the reality is, if we look at the last nine recessions in the US, only two were caused by overzealous tightening. There can be many reasons for recession. I would challenge the word stagflation. What we're seeing is a world where growth is reasonable. Maybe it's a bit more sluggish than before. Stagflation requires stagnation and inflation. We've got sluggish growth and inflation. Maybe it's slugflation. Slugflation. How do you deal with stagflation in Europe? We thought that the, the situation here, and again, I know it's a supply shock. People saying, look, the ECB could not have predicted these huge swings. But is there a danger that policy means tightening and then actually, you know, going reversing that very quickly? Well, I think within Europe, we've got a number of other cross currents. So if we look at Europe, we, we are more reliant on gas from Ukraine and Russia, and that yeah. creates that supply issue for energy. We also have a significant industrial base. And as a result, what that means is you know, impacts from raw materials prices. So there is a reason to think that Europe is perhaps going to ha have a little bit more of a tough time in the middle part of this year. But make no mistake, the ECB raising rates to zero actually is a bonus to the banking segment. And bear in mind, if we actually look into European uh, employment data, there's a lot more slack yeah. within the system there. So the, the clear and present risk through labour markets is less pronounced in Europe. The ECB have more latitude, we feel, mm. to plot a reasonable path. All right, John, thank you so much. Inventing the word slugflation and at the same time wearing a bow tie next time. So he's definitely coming back. In fact, John Bilton is so good, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, that he's coming up after the break as well. Uh, the president of Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky, having gone to many parliaments or speaking to parliaments, starting with the U.S. Congress last week, now speaking to the Dutch parliament. So we'll get plenty more on those headlines as they break. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne.
Hi, Francine, and thank you. The U.S. claims to have intelligence suggesting Vladimir Putin has been misinformed over the war in Ukraine. According to the White House, advisers to the Russian president are said to be afraid to tell him the truth about the performance of his military. We believe that Putin is being misinformed by his advisers about how badly the Russian military is performing and how the Russian economy is being crippled by sanctions because his senior advisers are too afraid to tell him the truth. Now, Germany says that Russia is backing off its demand for gas payments in rubles. According to a German readout of a call between President Putin and Chancellor Olaf Scholz, the Russian leader says European buyers could continue paying for gas in euros. The comments appear to be a de-escalation from Moscow after the G7 refused to agree to the move. Now, the US and Australia have criticized India for considering a proposal from Moscow that would undermine sanctions and post by America and its allies. This is Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov travels to Delhi for talks. Separately, Bloomberg understands Russia is offering India discounts of as much as $35 a barrel on crude oil. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, the U.S. says Russian President Vladimir Putin was misled by his military leader about the war in Ukraine. Our Leanne was also saying the same thing. Germany says the Kremlin is backing off demands for gas payments in rubles. So we'll have the latest developments, of course, on Russia next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Germany says for President Putin is backing off his demand that Berlin pays for Russian gas in rubles. And the White House, meanwhile, is saying that Putin was misinformed by his advisers on the war in Ukraine. Now, let's get straight to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeu, who's in Budapest. Maria, of course, you're in Budapest, also head of the elections. And the link between Budapest, or certainly Viktor Orban, and uh, Russia is something that we need to talk about. But first of all, is the clam down from Putin over his ruble payment demands to Europe real. Well, Francine, we'll have to wait and see. But if you look at what the Germans uh, briefed yesterday after the call between the Chancellor and President Putin, is that nothing will change in those contracts. That European nations will continue to pay for Russian gas in Europe. So then after that, the Gazprom Bank can decide what it wants to do with it, keep it in euros or convert it to rubles. But this is not a change in the mandate of the contracts. And that was a main takeaway from the Germans yesterday. They also said that Chancellor Schultz asked Vladimir Putin for a document in writing. So he can take a look at the details of this new rubles for gas demand. Now, when you look at what the Russians said, however, it was very little detail, and they just said the talks continue about this new payment system that Vladimir Putin wants. But for the time being, and to answer your question, yes, the euro payments continue. You could argue for some that is a side of relief. But fundamentally, Francine, if you take a step back from this, it doesn't really address the issue. Whether you pay euros or rubles, you're paying Russia for gas. And critics will tell you, ultimately, this is fine financing a war that's now on day 36. Yeah. Um, Maria, at the same time, Viktor Orban's ties to Putin, of course, are adding to a lot of, well, are adding not only the stakes, but also questions about the upcoming election. What does this all mean for Europe? Well, Francine, you know, we've talked about the big realignments we've seen already in Europe as a result of the war in Ukraine when it comes to defense, when it comes to military spending. And now here, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, there's a big political realignment. Usually, you know this very well, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Hungary, they all work together, they lobby together, they carry similar policies. But this time around, Hungary is the odd one out. It looks very different to its neighbors. It says it wants to keep the country neutral. It does not want to be a hub for weapons distribution. 
Commission. And Viktor Orban continues to say he would not be in favor of a full energy embargo from Russia. We know he has a personal friendship with Vladimir Putin. He was one of the last Western leaders to go to Moscow before the invasion happened. And he says a lot of this is counterproductive. The one thing I would also say, Francine, on a personal note, yesterday I was very surprised that in Budapest you're still able to watch Russian TV. I looked at it in my hotel. Remember, in Europe, the satellite pictures have been taken off uh, TV. And when you look at Ukraine, uh, Hungarian TV, yep. excuse me, they talk about a conflict, not so much a war, but a conflict in which the two sides have provoked each other. Maria, thanks so much for all the reporting on the ground. Maria, today out there in Budapest. Now we're back with John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. John, I guess the main concern is that markets either have a short memory or there are also, uh, you know, a lot of young folks that are working in the markets that don't even remember when interest rates were high that haven't really had to deal with any of these geopolitical crises. What are the odds of something going wrong? We don't really talk about China that much in our markets, but actually there's a, also a huge shift in that part of the world that will reverberate here. I think that's true. I mean, I th look, I think we should uh, give credit to the fact that there's still a decent amount of grey hair. I sport some myself around uh, around dealing floors. No, in the you're city. young. <laughs> Too young still. But you know, don't remember, we saw a rate hiking cycle um, yeah. from 2015 to 2018. So yeah. it's not like uh, the markets are naive. A little bit. Could yeah. something go <laughs> wrong? Of course, something can always go wrong. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a situation where the economic outlook has shifted. We've yes. not dealt with combined monetary and fiscal stimulus before and the knock-on effect on inflation. So, you know, in many regards, central banking is the perfect example of learning by doing. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, I think responding to the data in front of them is, is what yeah. they're doing today. May they have to go further? May they push the US into a, a more tight con set of conditions? It's yeah. possible. But I think it would be also important not to get over-focused over on that yeah. today. Okay. That's a problem for down the line. Now, China, as you mentioned, super interesting situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, emerging markets underperformed developed markets, you know, largely led by China over the past year or so by about 30%. It's a significant valuation discount across uh, parts of the Chinese equity market. But at the same time, we've got the cross current of rising COVID cases yeah. and question marks about supply chain. So, John, do, will they have to actually put more fiscal and monetary stimulus? And do you play that divergence? I, th I think that there's an argument that, the, um, that China are more likely than pretty much any other major bloc to be able to stimulate their economy in one way, shape or form. And so if you know, folks are worried about the fact that you've got tightening conditions elsewhere, loosening conditions in China could be a reason to start to be looking at it. Yeah. Personally, when I look at, for instance, the Chinese tech sector, it feels like there's a lot of, be of it being buffeted around by yeah. news flow. And that's the hallmarks of a market that's putting in a bottom. So I do wonder whether we need to be watching China and EM more broadly quite closely for when we may get an opportunity to be able to rotate back towards it. March 31st, end of a quarter, what's your boldest car, c call right now? Um, well, I think given um, all of the talk about twos, tens and, uh, you know, could we be slipping into contraction, I actually think credit markets look really pretty resilient. Corporate balance sheets are in great shape. Yep. And I really do think that unlike previous cycles where, you know, you see two tens flatten and then credit mm. kind of doesn't do so well, I actually think credit could be the surprise performer. John, thank you so much, as always, for coming on. John Bilton there, head of global multi-asset strategy and JP, at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more on technology and diversifying chips. Apple looks to expand its roster of memory chip suppliers, including considering a Chinese maker for the first time. We also talk about a hack. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Apple looking to diversify its supply chain for memory chips. That's after production disruption and a key Japanese partner exposed the risks of its global supply. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex, I have a million questions about Apple because there's also a hack which may involve teenagers in London. But on this supply, you know, um, I guess divergence or the fact that they're changing, why go after a Chinese supplier? Well, I guess they always want to have as many po sources as possible, yeah. not least because it lets them play suppliers off against one another. Mm -hmm. China is it's interesting because China, we think of iPhones being made there, but actually it's really just assembly that happens in China. The actual okay. kind of guts of the thing get made elsewhere and imported. Mm -hmm. China's been trying to make 
build its chip industry up. Memory is kind of the lowest spec part of that. Okay. It's a really commoditized piece. Okay. It's not the brains of the device. So Apple also considering an in-house financial payment system. On the back of that, I think some of the big financials in the US Wall Street that were involved in that have been falling. Yeah, and the thing is that that is actually something that when the uh, refresh rate, the pace at which people get new iPhones is slowing. Yeah. It's now three years maybe. And they expect maybe if there's not a big upgrade in the years ahead, that's going to extend even further. This is a way of eking more margin mm -hmm. out of the customers that you have. But bottom line, is it just me? It, does it mean that they're betting big on China and they want to be friendlier to China? Um, yeah, certainly. If they if they go for this Chinese supply, yeah. they are forging closer relationship to it, and you know that helps China when it's making the case in the U.S. that there shouldn't yeah. be trade sanctions. Alex, hacking the old way. So this is not like sophisticated hacking. This is pretending to be law enforcement and hacking Meta and Apple. The most vulnerable part in any company <laughs> when it comes to hacking is humans, right? The, the, <laughs> the, like the actual systems are often quite waterproof, but human error is often the biggest problem. This was, as we the reporting suspects, it's sort of a group of teenagers kicking up a storm. In London, right? Potentially, or not, but I think. Yeah. Uh, that is not perhaps as dangerous, maybe. That's no. easier to say for me. I'm not the person who's been hacked, but like, it's not as dangerous as sort of a nation state level hack, for instance. But so what, so they would have called, allegedly, they would have called and pretended to be law enforcement and paperwork. say, I need all this data. Exactly, submitted paperwork, which essentially spoofs what law enforcement officials would have submitted. Usually this requires sign off from a judge, but there is a mechanism where something is super urgent. Say there's a terrorist attack, then you can get around some of those controls. Alex, I don't know whether that's comforting or not. I mean, it, you know, it, it, what does it mean that they it's, it seems so dumb that you would give it that way? I mean, look, the moment you give your data to anyone, if, if you trust that person, that you're leaving it out of your control. And so that's always going to be the risk. You, nothing is 100 percent secure. Alex, thank you so much, as always, with some great insight, of course, on some of these technology stocks. Now we'll have plenty more on Apple. We'll also have plenty more on the market. So we're seeing a bit of a reversal when it comes to European stocks. Uh, they were gaining. Now they're a lot lower than they were about 10 minutes ago. So let's bring it up. You can see European stocks down some one tenth of a percent. The focus will be on the price of oil. It's very clear that energy stocks are now falling with oil uh, on report that the Biden administration is considering a massive release of crude from U.S. reserves to fight inflation. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller, Katie Lyons in New York, and Anna Edwards here in London. This is Bloomberg. It's going to be a sloppy, choppy, messy year. The downside risks are so great at the moment. In the longer run, uh, and I, I don't mean years, I mean a month or so, uh, I think the oil markets uh, will basically recover in terms of su supply side. We have one objective only, which is trying to maintain the supply to the the market and ensure that that supply is affordable this is bloomberg surveillance early edition with anna edwards matt miller and kaylee lines it's 10 a.m in london 5 a.m in new york and 5 p.m in hong kong on this thursday march 31st our top stories today the Biden administration is considering a massive release of oil from U.S. reserves to fight inflation. A million barrels a day could be released for months. OPEC Plus isn't expected to help much. The cartel and its allies are expected to rebuff calls to pump even more oil. And in France, inflation is running faster than expected. Consumer prices rose 5.1 percent in March from a year ago. The ramp up in inflation across Europe is putting pressure on the ECB to consider raising interest rates. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Lisa Abramowitz and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Kayleigh, those expectations or that pressure on the ECB still many months away, it seems, in terms of rate raising rates across the Eurozone. But the, the pressure on oil prices uh, from oil prices is lessened a little bit today by what we've heard from the U.S. Yeah, potentially a massive reserve release coming down the line from the U.S. Also, Anna, happy last day of the first quarter. It has felt like a very, very long one, and it is a quarter that ended on a downbeat note in Asia overnight. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index was lower by about eight tenths of one percent. Now, in part, sentiment was weighed down by weaker manufacturing PMI data out of China, once again in contraction territory, and that was even before the Shanghai lockdown we've seen put in into place this week really signals uh, the, the issue the Chinese economy has with its COVID-0 
zero policy. The other drag in Asia overnight was Chinese tech stocks. The Hang Seng Tech Index falling about 1.4% after SEC chairman here in the U.S. Gary Gensler threw some cold water on the speculation that a deal was close on those 200 Chinese uh, companies listed here in the U.S. being able to stay on exchanges. Still a lot of questions around the outcome of those auditing uh, rules. I also wanted to point to what's going on in Japan because you are seeing that unprecedented intervention by the BOJ continuing uh, to make a difference in the bond market, specifically at the long end of the curve, that 30 year yield coming in eight basis points overnight. We're sitting just south of 94 basis points. Meanwhile, the Japanese yen is stronger again today. 121.10 is where it trades against the dollar, Lisa. Well, I will say that today, definitely the focus in the United States, all about the prospective 180 million barrel release of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves that the Biden administration announced yesterday. That is coloring all of the action in pricing. You are seeing a little bit of a lift in S&P futures, and this comes in the heels of a bit of a suppression in the bond space. How much does this actually relieve pressure on the Federal Reserve to raise rates as quickly if the inflation from the commodity impulse isn't rising as quickly? Ten-year yields, 2 point. 327% crude. You can see that decline, nearly 6% uh, decline at one point, now down 5.2% on the NYMEX. How much are we looking at something that could potentially actually bolster the U.S. economy? How much is that with sort of edifying the dollar at a time when there still are significant concerns about stagflation in Europe? And Anna, when we talk about Europe and those inflation numbers, the sell-off in the bond market there has just been astronomical, really raising questions of how much further it has to go. Yeah, absolutely. A big focus on that bond market selling from a European perspective over recent days. This is the stock market picture, Lisa, and you said that the S&P uh, was getting a little bit of a boost. Futures were getting a bit of a boost from that down uh, move in oil prices. Well, that, start, that was the case here in Europe at the start of our trading day, but that move has faded a little bit now. And you see European equity markets a little undecided in which way to go, actually moving slightly to the downside on some of the large continental European markets. We just had in Italian inflation d uh, data out, and it does play into the narrative of higher inflation because 7% is a high inflation rate, of course, by historic standards. But it does make a change to see an inflation print coming in just below estimates. The estimate was for 7.2, but not much below as, uh, as, as those numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the euro, 111.28. Lisa was talking about dollar strength there. Brent crude then, uh, just keeping an eye on where we are on this oil story then. Lisa pointing to that big move in WTI. Substantial move also in Brent crude, down by 4.3%. This was in the early part of the session. Uh, well, it continues to weigh on oil prices, and it was pushing aviation stocks higher here in Europe. It continues to do that to some degree, and we see the likes of Wizz Air up by 3%. H&M down by more than 9%. The clothing retailer, uh, really uh, uh, some cautious wording coming around from this business. They don't declare exactly their exposure to Russia, but it was a really big growth market for the business. It was apparently really profitable for the business. They've had to close those stores, and so uh, growth is not going to be increasing as fast as it was, and that is a bit of a hit to this business. Talking of Russia, let me show you where we are on some Russian assets. We've seen ongoing normalization steps coming through, if you like, in Russian stocks. It's not a normal market by any stretch yet, uh, but we have seen the reintroduction of short selling for local investors. Foreign investors are not able to even sell stocks right now, uh, but so as a result, we don't have a, an, an exact picture of, of uh, Russian stocks, but we have seen quite a substantial rebound from the start of the invasion. 4.7% to the upside in just, or moving higher, sorry, in just today's session. Uh, this is the uh, Russian currency moving higher as well, the dollar down, the ruble up by 2.3%. Interesting to see that commentary, Kaylee, from the German and saying that President Putin has stepped back a little from calling, uh, or, the, or the, the Russians have stepped back from calling for ruble payments for energy products. The Russians have a slightly different take on things, but that's the German story. That's what they are, uh, that's what they are uh, suggesting has taken place. Yeah, and of course, we'll have more on that energy story, specifically on natural gas later on this hour. But later on today, it really will be all about oil. OPEC Plus is meeting virtually to discuss its next course of action, not expected to stray from its course of modest production hikes. Then New York Fed President John Williams will be making opening remarks at a conference on the future of New York City hosted by his bank later on. Blue Origin also will be flying six people into suborbital space on the company's fourth crewed mission. And finally, in geopolitics, Russian foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will arrive in India for a two-day visit, Lisa. I will say that everyone's watching to see what the tit-for-tat is actually going to be if there's a material pullback from Russians in Ukraine. Meanwhile, really the focus, as we've been saying uh, over the bulk of this morning, is on oil. The Biden administration weighing a massive release of oil. We're talking 180 million barrels, potentially, from the reserves. Bloomberg uh, has learned about this and the perspective uh, for President Biden to speak and talk about what this will do in terms of the 
price of gas. Jack Fitzpatrick covering it all from Bloomberg government uh, down in D.C. Give us a sense, Jack, of what we expect to hear from President Biden later today. Well, they haven't announced exactly what the details of this are going to be. He's supposed to talk at 1.30 about energy issues, but our colleagues have spoken to people familiar uh, with these discussions who have reported that the conversations are around about a million barrels per day being released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that could total up to about 180 million barrels total. That is a, a historic release if that's what they decide to do. It obviously doesn't address the structural issues ar around gas prices and all of that, but uh, considering the fact that there are some aspects Estimates that globally consumption could outpace uh, uh, supply by uh, or production rather in the second quarter by about 800,000. It could make a very significant difference uh, in in making up that gap. It's not the kind of thing that would replenish any uh, thinning reserves, but this would be a, a very significant thing from the U.S. Keep in mind they have about 568 million barrels available in that reserve. Maximum drawdown capacity is about 4.4 million a day. It's not as if they're taking everything out of it, but this would be a, a massive, massive release of oil from that reserve for, uh, histo from a historic perspective from the U.S. Well, and obviously, Jack, the need to get more oil in the market exacerbated by the supply challenge uh, coming from Russia and the sanctions put in place on it. While discussing Russia, we of course heard from the U.S. yesterday as well that intelligence suggests that Putin is feeling misled by those closest to him. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, they, they've said that the, the Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, did not get particularly good advice about uh, his military's capability. Some of this may be stating the obvious a little bit, considering the, the way Russia Russian officials talked about uh, a, a, not even a, a full-scale war, but sort of somewhat of a, a military operation in Ukraine. The, clearly, there was an expectation that this would not be so dragged out, that whatever would happen would happen much more quickly. Uh, the, the U.S. officials have not detailed exactly who misled whom uh, and, and where the origin of this was, but the, the White House communication directors spoke to that a bit yesterday, saying uh, that the Russian president did feel misled about exactly what their capabilities were, uh, and clearly this is not the way Russia expected things to pan out in Ukraine. Jack, thanks very much. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government joining us there from Washington. Uh, now, Jack was talking there about what's been happening with oil and the politics in the United States. Oil has dropped in response, dropping sharply on signs that the Biden administration is considering this uh, big release of crude from U.S. reserves. The news comes ahead of an OPEC Plus meeting today. Let's get more on the oil markets then with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Uh, Danny, thinking about the SPR then, this is clearly putting downside pressure on oil prices. It is. We are looking at oil dropping around 5% in the U.S. WTI. It had been even deeper of losses since then, but it's come back slightly. Look, I think few would deny that the short-term implications of this are huge. Jack was describing the size there, so I won't rehash all of it, but it does help to ease some of these short-term supply pressures. Further down the road, that gets a little bit murky considering the structural deficiencies in this oil market. And one thing that Jim Bianco points out that I think is really smart, this idea of what it means for the SBR going forward. Inventories pulled down to the 180 million barrels that our estimate would take this to a 40-year low. This is supposed to be an emergency reserve. So at some point, they're going to have to fill the coffers back up so the market just might down the road price in another buyer, which in turn pushes the price of oil up. All right, Danny, this is all on the U.S. side. What about OPEC Plus? Do they feel any pressure at all to change their course today? Well, if anything, this eases the pressure for them to change their course. Little expectations were out there that they would increase the quota that they'd already agreed on some months back, the 400,000 barrels um, a day. And of course, oil looking a lot cheaper today. And look, they haven't even met those quotas. And we're likely to see even less Russia oil online in the coming months. OPEC has shown little appetite to support Washington to the detriment of Moscow. Um, and of course, oil diplomacy, Kaylee, it's a long-term gain. And if there are even indeed concerns of recession, 
oversupply could quickly, uh, undersupply rather, could quickly turn to oversupply in this oil market. Yeah, have to factor in demand as well. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Now, Ukraine says talks with Russia are set to resume on Friday. That's tomorrow via video conference after in-person talks in Turkey this week did not produce a ceasefire or major progress toward a broader peace deal. Let's go to our Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent who is joining us from Budapest. So, Maria, are we seeing any signs of how far from a real de-escalation we are in this war? Well, no. And if you look at what President Zelensky said uh, overnight yesterday is that in many ways that convoy moving away from Kyiv just reflects that this was a fortress city. It had been locked and sealed by the Ukrainian capitals and the Russians in many ways could not have taken uh, the city. They also feel that a lot of the uh, deployments could be moving to the east around the Donbass area. And remember, that has been the big concern for the Ukrainian government. The Russian troops are essentially trying to split the country in two. That's, of course, for the action on the ground. When it comes to the talks, we know there will be a video conference, but experience, especially when you look back at the previous rounds here, tell you that those video conferences usually do not produce anything. It's the meetings face to face uh, that take the conversation forward. So in many ways, we're back to how we were on Monday. Maria, amid all of this backdrop and the potential for talks, you're in Budapest. You're in Hungary. Why? Well, look, there's an election happening here. Of course, Viktor Orban, if you don't know him, he's been in power already for 12 uh, years. This is someone that I'm sure in America you would know him because he was a supporter of President Trump. This is someone who speaks very highly of Christian values, family values, traditional values. And that was the topic of conversation going into the election. But the problem is, of course, this is a country that now neighbors Ukraine. And Hungary now finds itself in a very awkward position. We've talked about the political realignment as a result of the invasion from Russia into Ukraine. Well, we're seeing that play out here. This is a country that carries now a foreign policy that some argue is too neutral, perhaps, or too friendly to Russia. It's a complete opposite of what neighbors are doing in Poland, Slovakia, and so on. He says he doesn't want to see an energy embargo from Russian energy. He doesn't want to deliver weapons into Ukraine. And, of course, he keeps repeating this is a conflict in which Hungary has to stay out. And just very briefly, to me, it really caught my attention yesterday when I arrived in Budapest and I turned on the TV that I could actually watch Russian mm -hmm. TV. Remember, in the rest of the European Union, most places in Europe, the satellite signal has been taken down, quote, because it's a propaganda machine. Well, that's not a problem in Budapest. It's a war of information as well. Thank you so much to Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent from a beautiful and rainy Budapest. Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. A big mover to the downside is UiPath. This is the robotics automation software company. Gave a light revenue forecast overnight. Analysts cutting their price targets as a result, and the price of that stock is moving lower in early hours, trading around 2480, down nearly 15 percent. I also want to get a check on Apple. Of course, it snapped its longest winning streak since 2000. 2003 yesterday. This morning, though, shares moving back to the upside by about four tenths of a percent or so. Bloomberg reporting overnight that the company is looking for new suppliers for its memory chips for its iPhones, potentially even looking at a Chinese uh, producer. So really trying to diversify that supply chain. And speaking of production happening in China, I wanted to point to Tesla as well, because according to sources, it has extended its shutdown of its Shanghai factory for at least another day. Of course, it has been shut down since Monday due to the lockdown in the city. But Tesla stairs, uh, Shugging that off today, still up about six tenths of a percent before the bell, Anna. Now coming up on the program, Kaylee, Skyler Montgomery Koning, TS Lombard Senior Global Macro Strategist. We will talk about what is happening in these markets, the significance of the weaker oil price, where that uh, leaves equities, where it leaves bonds and the growth outlook. We'll also talk to Anne-Sophie Corbeau, Global Research Scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. So many interesting angles on the energy story, including, of course, the SPR release. We'll start with that. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Lisa Abramowitz and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. I think he'd like this chart, though. This shows inflation across parts of the, uh, the Eurozone. This is France and Italy, not because they're the, uh, the highest numbers in terms of inflation. I've seen Lithuanian inflation up at 15%, I think, already. Uh, but this is just interesting because this is the data that broke today. But more, uh, more additions, if you like, to that picture of higher inflation across the Eurozone. Christine Aquino, Bloomberg Markets Editor, joins us uh, with her perspective. Christine, uh, this data then just adding to that, uh, that pressure, we understand, on the ECB to try and do something about this. But there's a lot of policy normalisation to go before we get rate hikes from the ECB, uh, isn't there? I mean, we're talking about pressure on the ECB to do something, but the market's not pri pricing in hikes until much later on this year. Well, Anna, yeah, I think we did see some movement on the pricing front this year. I know that they are now seeing about 100 basis points of rate hikes for the ECB over the next year. So even if it's not not necessarily a 2022 story. It could be something that plays out in 2023. And remember also that uh, traders are now seeing the end of the ECB negative rate era slightly earlier this year in uh, October rather than December. So the direction of travel in terms of market expectations is definitely for the ECB to, to really kick start that normalization process and get a move on when it comes mm. to rate hikes. But as you mentioned, they're not even uh, finished winding down their asset purchases just yet. And so that really raises the pressure on on them to start signaling the end of that and moving on to the rates conversation. Well, and of course, the Fed here in the U.S., Christine, has signaled they're going to move even more aggressively. They're already moving, and yet treasuries aren't hit as hard as bonds in Europe. Why? Well, Kaylee, I think a few reasons there, a little bit of confusion over, you know, the impact of um, uh, the inflation story, the war in Ukraine and what's that, what that's doing to commodities and how that plays into the Fed equation. I think, you know, the, the best explanation that I've seen for this is probably this idea that potentially a de-escalation in the Ukraine uh, situation could uh, slow the Fed down in its tightening pace. But then the, the question there there is, you know, there's a lot of reason already for the Fed to go with the tightening pace that they've indicated, even without that commodity story. We know that the labor market is quite hot in the U.S. We know that cost of um, goods beyond energy is rising, and that's something that the Fed really wants to address. And so there are these kind of uh, jarring factors, competing factors here, playing into the Treasury market. But ultimately, I think the direction of a Fed race is still very much higher, as we've heard from several policymakers. Christine, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Christine Aquino joining us live on set here in London. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog, MLIV Go. That is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Lisa Abramowitz in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Another big payday for J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon. He just received almost $56 million of J.P. Morgan stock before taxes. It comes from an incentive program the bank valued at less than half that just three years ago. The latest windfall was helped by surging business during the pandemic. Apple is exploring new sources of the memory chips that go into its iPhones. Bloomberg has learned that potentially includes its first Chinese supplier. A production disruption at one of Apple's key Japanese partners exposed the risks to its global supply. And the chair of the SEC is downplaying speculation that there could be a deal to keep 200 Chinese companies from losing their U.S. listings. Gary Gensler singled that only total compliance with U.S. audit inspections will allow them to keep trading on American markets. And Lisa, it's so funny, just a few months ago we were talking about Chinese pressure for Chinese companies to delist from the U.S. Now it seems the U.S. may be the one to force that hand. Perhaps just trying to put imminence on these talks to get to some sort of resolution as we do hear that those neg negotiations are ongoing. Yeah, it looks as if it could be something that's uh, a long time in the in the making. He's looking a couple of years out in these latest comments from uh, Gary Gensler. We'll keep monitoring that. Skyler Montgomery Coning from TS Lombard up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know.
The Biden administration is weighing a massive release of oil from U.S. reserves to fight inflation. Bloomberg's learned a million barrels of oil a day may be released for months for up to 180 million barrels. President Biden is set to speak on efforts to reduce energy prices later today. OPEC Plus isn't expected to help much on that front. The cartel and its allies are expected to rebuff calls to pump more oil. Member nations are again likely to stick to a schedule of gradual oil output increases. And in France, inflation is running faster than expected. Consumer prices rose 5.1% in March from a year ago. And in Italy, inflation surged to 7%, the highest in three decades as energy prices continue to rise following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The ramp up in inflation is putting pressure on the ECB to normalise policy and eventually raise interest rates. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Lisa Abramowitz and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. Matt Miller is out today. The big focus then for markets is on energy and a little bit, bit of respite today then, Lisa, from higher oil prices because of what we expect to hear from the U.S. administration later. Which, which really brings us to where we are now and what took us there. In other words, this oil shock, this stagflationary shock that people were looking at, why we're getting a reprieve, a little bit of an uptick in the S&P, futures up about one-tenth of a percent, 46.02 why? It's because perhaps we could lower the price of gasoline in the United States, lower the price of oil with that uh, with that incredible release, which would be the biggest ever. You're seeing 10-year yields uh, come off a little bit, 2.336 percent down uh, about a basis point. But just to give you perspective, this has been the biggest weekly, uh, biggest quarterly rise in 10-year yields going back to 2016, biggest quarterly rise in two-year yields going back to 1984. Just to give you perspective, in crude off about by 5.6% traded on the NYMEX in the heels in the face of what we're seeing with this potential oil reserve release in the dollar. A little bit of strength, perhaps, Kaylee, because people view this as a positive for economic growth, but really it's not a significant move and how much staying power this has given that it does not solve the structural problems remains to be seen. Yeah, that's a really good point, Lisa. And when I'm looking at pre-market trading, I see that a lot of the movement is actually tied to what we're seeing in oil. With prices going down, that means energy stocks are being dragged down as well. Devon Energy is down 2.5%. Exxon is down by about 2.1%. But on the flip side of that, beneficiaries of potentially lower oil prices, therefore lower, lower fuel prices, that would be the airlines. And you are seeing those moving to the upside. United's only up about four-tenths of 1%. American, though, higher by a little more than a full percentage point, Anna. And Kaylee, what we're seeing here on European equity markets then is a little bit of a move lower for European stocks. We started out in positive territory. The move lower in energy prices are clearly adding to some appetite for risk appetite in the early part of the European session. But that has waned a little bit. And we're just moving a little lower on the stocks Europe at 600. Brent crude moving down by just over 5%. To Lisa's point, I spoke to the CEO of a, uh, of a Spanish energy business, a refining business earlier on today. And he was absolutely saying, look, this is not going to change the long-term fundamentals, the mismatch of supply and demand. But yes, it does have an impact in the short term, and we certainly see that here with that move of 5% in Brent crude. Uh, Kaylee, you were mentioning moves higher in, in, in uh, aviation stocks pre-market in the U.S. That's certainly a theme that we've seen here in Europe. This is Wizz Air, of course, very exposed to the Eastern European business as well, to the Eastern European market, and that uh, particular stock up by 2.5% this morning. H&M really in focus as a result of Russia as well, uh, and this is because this company was growing really fast in Russia. It was also a source of profitability. Uh, they've had to close their stores there, and the numbers today disappointing the market. With an eye on Russia, let us recap where we are on Russian stocks. A bit of normalization taking place on the Russian markets, not all uh, normal by any stretch because still foreign investors cannot sell stocks there. Uh, but this is the picture as we stand, uh, as we find it now, up by 5.6% on the Russian stock market. We have local investors now able to short stocks and we have a full trading day. That's the first time we've been able to say that uh, since the invasion. This is the dollar down, the ruble up. The ruble continues to make a little bit of ground as it has been doing over recent sessions, in fact, up by around 2%. Interesting to see the Germans say that the Russians are stepping back from calling for ruble payments for their gas. Uh, we'll see that, where that develops. Kaylee. All right, Anna. Well, let's get back to the monetary policy story here in the U.S. We spoke with Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin in an exclusive interview yesterday and asked whether he'd be open to a 50 basis point hike in May. Take a listen. I'm open to it. Uh, I think the question, and we'll make this decision when we get to the meeting in May, is how strong does the economy uh, still look in terms of its ability to take rate increases and how high is inflation persisting? So I'm looking at both of those and we'll make our call in May. Joining us now is Skylar Montgomery Koenig, T.S. Lombard, Senior Global Macro Strategist. So, Skylar, 
seems like the drumbeat is toward 50 basis points in May. The market expects it's going to go far beyond that. 200 basis points more in tightening just this year alone. If you had to put odds on a soft landing or on a recession by the end of next year, which one is in favor? I mean, it depends on what economy you're looking at for sure. But our base case for the U.S. is that we'll probably get a soft landing. And, and you know, the government bond sell-off has been remarkable. And that's because of the mac macro backdrop, right? So you've got developed market central banks aggressively tightening, heightened geopolitical risk is here to stay. And, and that knock-on effect, as you say, is, is a deteriorating growth inflation mix. And that's, you know, very worrying for risk assets, especially worrying because it affects the correlation between bonds and equities. Um, but, you know, we're still at very, very decent growth numbers in the U.S. We're coming down to normalization. But if you think about kind of 2.5% year-on-year growth in the U.S., for a normal cycle, that's pretty good. And, and we don't think that the Fed will go so far as, as to put us past that point of being worried about it. Um, you know, people are making quite a lot of noise about the fact that the two cents curve is inverted. But, you know, we've done quite a lot of analysis about what curves you should actually be looking at and, and whether or not, you know, it, it's just kind of signaling the inflation backdrop rather than signaling the fact that a recession is coming. And, and we think it's more of a reflection of the inflation backdrop and, and not all curves are inverting. And so, you know, for us, I think it's more likely that you see a soft landing and, and you see kind of, you know, growth isn't materially hit in the U.S. by... Um, by the Russia-Ukraine situation, it's, it is definitely more of a worry for other markets, though, including Europe. Skylar, is it a better outcome for U.S. equity markets to see profit margins increase, to see earnings come in hot, or the opposite, considering the fact that the Federal Reserve doesn't want to see them passing along all those price increases right now to consumers? <laughs> they don't want to see the pricing power that leads to something more akin to an inflationary spiral. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a very, very big difference in the type of inflation when you think about that kind of thing, right? So the Russia-Ukraine situation and the effect that it's having on energy prices. And so we think that it's going to be a protracted situation, so you're going to get energy prices higher for longer. That is a supply shock. That is bad for equity markets. It's bad for the economy globally because it's the supply bit of the equation that's forcing inflation up. And that's very worrying because it means when you pass on price increases, it doesn't have the effect of, you know, there's more growth and so people are able to spend more and, and they take those price increases. Whereas if it's a demand shock, you know, it's because people are demanding more. You can raise prices. And, and that's what we saw, you know, immediately post-COVID is you had huge margin mm. expansion. Equities are rising. You had stuff like shrinkflation and that kind of thing. But you had companies able to put higher prices on stuff because people were willing to accept it because the demand backdrop was good. And obviously, different countries had different variations of that. So the U.S. was much more demand-driven than, say, the U.K., which was more of a supply shock. And so the longer this crisis goes on, the more you shift that supply shock worries. And, and yes, it's, I mean, it's hard. It'll be hard to see if, if we get more supply shocks in that way, further margin expansion, further um, equity upside as a result of that. And so it's definitely more of a worrying mix as the longer it goes on. Skylar, good morning. In terms of the Eurozone economy, how do you see this playing out? Do you expect to see uh, stagflation in full or just some sort of stagflationary impulse? The ECB rejects uh, the suggestions that we'll see a recession in the Eurozone. That's not what their forecasts tell them. But guest, uh, one guest I spoke to this morning was, was suggesting that's where the Eurozone economy would be in the second half of this year. What is your expectation for the Eurozone? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at the numbers on Bloomberg in terms of consensus, dispersion is massive. The lowest number consensus forecast that you get for GDP for 2022 is 2.2%, and the highest, I think, is still somewhere above 5%, which just seems completely unreasonable. Um, the ECB is, you know, similarly behind the curve. At the March meeting, they downgraded 2022 growth forecast to zero by 0.5% rather than 3.7%. And that still seems very high for us. Um, so we're more around the 1.2% target, and we're well below consensus. And I think there's definitely a very good reason about that. You know, there's no doubt that the ECB is worried about widening rate differentials to U.S. weigh on the currency. They're worried about causing further inflation, and that creates a self-reinforcing cycle. But, you know, we also think the ECB is very data dependent. And so as you start to see the economy get hit by the higher energy prices, the outlook was already deteriorating before Russia Ukraine. And the situation in terms of energy prices just makes that so much worse. I mean, everyone knows now that they get 40% of their natural gas from Russia, Ukraine, but it's really starting to hurt. And you're not seeing it yet in the growth data. But as our European economist, Davide Oneglia, said, you're starting to see it in the confidence data. And so the confidence data that we've gotten recently 
it, you know, you could compare it to the confidence data you were seeing in COVID. And so while we don't expect a recession, our confidence bands are so large around that 1.2% that it's, it's worryingly so close to a recession. So definitely a higher risk than even a month ago. Skylar Montgomery, Koning, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Of T.S. Lombard, senior global macro strategist, thank you so much for being with us. Coming up, a really important conversation on oil, on energy, and Sophie Corbeau, a global research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, will be joining to talk about the possible oil reserve release and much more. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Tilray CEO Erwin Simon. That's at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, oil has tumbled as the U.S. weighs releasing reserves again to cool prices. Joining us now for more is Anne-Sophie Corbeau, Global Research Scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Anne-Sophie, thank you very much for joining us. Now, your specialism is gas, and we certainly want to get, your, get to your expertise on gas because from a European perspective, this is incredibly important, the relationship with Russia. If I could just start on the messaging you take away, though, from what we're hearing from the Biden administration. They're expected today to announce a, a big uh, release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of signal will this send to the broad energy complex, do you think, Anne-Sophie? I think they are signaling that the U.S. is ready to act. And, you know, I mean, releasing uh, the strategic oil reserves is not something that you do every day. Uh, this is not something which is happening on uh, on an usual basis. But, I mean, the markets, the oil markets, remain fundamentally very tight. So, I mean, this is a problem. Uh, and, and we are going to continue to see the tightness with potentially prices remaining at uh, above $100 per barrel for, for quite a sustained amount of time. OK, and thinking about where we are on the gas story then here in Europe, and sophie um, we obviously have been, well, Europe has been already very vocal about its need to reduce reliance on Russian gas imports. All the measures we've heard so far, whether that's LNG coming from the United States, whether that's Qatar looking to send some LNG to Europe, or at least the Europeans asking for that to take place, are you seeing anything that's going to make a material difference so far as to how Europe replaces that Russian gas? I mean, first of all, this amount of Russian gas is really very important. It's about 40% of what the European Union is importing right now. It's not something that you can replace overnight. I mean, the European Commission report, the WePower EU that they released about a month ago, was calling for a reduction of two-thirds of these imports by the end of the year. In my opinion, this is extremely difficult to achieve. What we have seen so far is really looking at the supply side and how we can get supply from the different parts of the market, from the pipeline suppliers, but also from the LNG suppliers. I have not seen a lot of talks about reducing demand. You know, in 73, when, when there was the oil shock, you know, I think everybody was urged to reduce its consumption. The governments have, I mean, there are talks about, yeah, you should reduce your consumption. And it's not only about gas, by the way. I mean, every single kilowatt hour of energy counts. But they are not like messages hammered every day, you need to reduce your consumption. It's very, very important. No, I mean, what we see in terms of measures are, you know, uh, prices being capped in certain number of countries in order to protect consumers. And I think uh, governments are worry, uh, worried about having a yellow vest movement. So they are really trying to protect all the consumers because, as you said before, you know, there is a rise in energy prices. This is triggering a rise in, in inflation. This is also going to trigger some problems down the line in terms of food supplies. But what I see is that all the attention has been given to securing additional supplies. There has been talks with Qatar, there have been talks with the United States. But, you know, we need to act on both sides. We need to act on demand and on supply as well. Okay, so maybe shifting focus a little bit to the other end of that balance, Anne Sophie. I'm wondering as well, in terms of supply, how much of the issue relies on literally just the supply being available of other countries having the capacity, the excess to send to Europe, and how much of a problem the existing infrastructure is, the ability for Europe to actually take in LNG at export terminals, for example? <laughs> 
that's an excellent question. I mean, they are both problems exist. So first of all, Europe has never been a key market in the global LNG market. Asia is a key market. Asia attracts the LNG. Europe is a balancing market, which can basically absorb the surplus when the market are loose and can send you know, the gas, the LNG away when the market are very tight. It has always worked like that. Think about 2020, all the surplus came back to Europe. Think about Fukushima. Europe sent LNG to Japan. So this is exactly how it has worked before. Now Europe is signaling, hey, I need LNG. I need LNG now. And indeed, the prices are much higher. So the LNG is coming to Europe. But Asia is still there. Asia still represents the mm. bulk of global LNG demand. And we have okay. countries which unfortunately can't afford to buy this LNG. This is Pakistan and Bangladesh. But we have other countries like China where LNG demand has been growing every single yes. year. So how are they going to react to that? This is a key question. I mean, whether countries yes. would be willing, like Japan, to maybe divert some LNG cargoes, but Japan made it very clear. Okay. It is not at the expense seen, of yeah, the security of Qatar supply. Talking, we've certainly seen Qatar talking about how uh, their gas already has a home. Just quickly then, Anne-Sophie, can I get your response to the German plan, stage one of a three-part plan to keep an eye on, at least at the, in the first stages, gas consumption. Are we going to possibly enter a stage of, of um, uh, rationing of energy supplies as we go into the winter across Europe, or can measures be taken to avoid that? I mean, it's again, you know, a question of we need to reduce our demand right now. I mean, right now it was just an early warning. What is important is what is going to happen next. I mean, you know, there is this kind of balance between, okay, we are looking at what Russia may be able to do or may want to do, but at the same time, we are continuing to import gas from Russia and, and the flows have been relatively constant so far. So there is some sort of, you know, ambiguity between we want to reduce our consumption from Russian gas. However, at the same time, we are still importing a lot because right now it's very difficult to secure additional supplies from other sources. This is, mm. this is a key problem. All right, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your insight. And Sophie Corbo, Global Research Scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Now we want to get the latest in crypto news. Bitcoin's rapid rally over the past few weeks has erased its losses for the year. But equity investors have yet to pile back into crypto-related stocks with the same conviction. Since hitting a six-month low in late January, Bitcoin prices have jumped in March. Meanwhile, the Melonian Bitcoin Exposure Index, which tracks stocks with exposure to cryptocurrencies, including Bright Blockchain, Galaxy Digital, that remains lower for 2022. Crypto mining firms have been among the hardest hit. Steep, sudden price swings not uncommon in the crypto space, but sharp declines in value like the one seen in Bitcoin to begin the year still create headaches for these stocks. While Bitcoin's recent rebound has erased some of the pressures, the run up in energy prices over the past month as a result of the war in Ukraine is likely to drive up operating expenses for the miners that need to consume large amounts of electricity in order to run their mining rigs. And for more on the world of decentralized finance, make sure to tune into Bloomberg Crypto every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time with myself and Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lines in New York. Joining us now, Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Uh, and Tom, you bring us, as you often do, your single best chart. And I know your single best chart today is a long view on US GDP. What have you concluded? Well, it's a long view of a statistic that goes back to 1947 when we started counting the beans. And this is from before the financial crisis, 2006. And this is the animal spirit, the nominal GDP Real GDP plus inflation of the United States of America. And I'm sorry, this is a victory lap for the institutional elites who said in the middle of COVID, all we can do is a fiscal response with a central bank that makes it work. Down we go off an established trend. We've come back with a vengeance. And of course, the real question here is the now what of it, given the price of all this fiscal expense, which is the inflation we're living. But it's a great chart of getting back to trend, exceeding trend, and now what forward for the nation.
Well, and of course, that same inflation exacerbated <clears throat> by the conflict in Ukraine, Tom. And I know you have a great guest to speak with about that later on today. Well, we'll talk to Ambassador House. Richard House will join us. He's all fired up. A great, really intelligent essay, frankly, off his, his book that was my book of the summer one year, uh, uh, Kaylee. And it is about American overreach. And we'll discuss that with Richard Haas. But I really want to emphasize, Kaylee, there's an underplaying in the media right now of the boom that we're in is a demand boom Yes, it's about the war. Yes, it's about hydrocarbons, et cetera. But a lot of this is just demand as we come out of COVID. Yeah, and the question, I guess, is when do we start to see demand destruction kick in with these higher prices consumers are facing? Tom see, King, you must be hanging out with Lisa. You gotta, I know. you got to spend less time with Abramowitz. That's she was on the show with me the last two days. <laughs> I it know. Influences it's, it's, me. It's, it's a massive influence. <laughs> All right. Well, I know you're looking forward to joining Lisa and John in just a few minutes' time. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you very much for joining us. Now a look at what else we are watching today. I have my eye on oil, Anna. Down pretty hard. WTI is down about... 7 or 5.7 percentage points at this point. On the one hand, you have OPEC plus probably not going to diverge from its course to add 400,000 barrels a day in oil on the market when it makes its decision for next month. At the same time, you have the Biden administration possibly considering a massive, massive release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. When I say massive, we are talking potentially 180 million barrels of oil. Mm. My question is really, Anna, how much does that actually make a difference in this market? We've seen them tap the SPR already twice in just a couple of months. Didn't actually really influence prices at the pump. Yeah. It typically has a short-term impact, doesn't it? And if the underlying fundamentals of supply and demand don't change, then that's where it ends. But this is big, and if it is designed to drip feed over, over day after day after day, then perhaps it has a different dynamic to it, Kaylee. I'm interested in the Chinese growth story right now. Tom was talking about rebounds coming out of COVID. Well, this is a very different story, isn't it, over in China. We had PMI data out of China just in the last 24 hours that looked pretty weak. An economy, uh, according to the PMI data, a danger of contraction there. And this was even before Shanghai went into lockdown down. What policy support will we get from the monetary, from the fiscal side? They're also talking about building up a fund to backstop financial services. A lot to think about on China. That is it, though, for the early edition. Bloomberg Surveillance still ahead. This is Bloomberg.